Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's another episode of Fix Your Business with your host, me, Robin Waite, uh, the fearless business coach. And today I've got an amazing guest on. Um, we're going to be learning about escape rooms. So over to you, Lizzie. Give us a quick potted history of uh, Labyrinthos. Uh, you've started very recently, so tell us about that and also um, where the business is at now and where you hope to get it to throughout the, the next, I know it's a tricky time at the moment, but the next yeah. 12 months or so. Yeah. So we started um, last, uh, last year, last um, November, and we've got two rooms at um, Create on the Square, our venue, um, and we grew really rapidly um, up to about 150 sessions a month and our turnover was was really really quite flourishing yeah and lots of potential for growth for delivering um delivering the rooms and uh, then lockdown <laughs> yeah so yeah. in terms of like so from november to sort of pre-lockdown you hit eight and a half k turnover which is absolutely phenomenal for yeah. a small, small local business yeah um, and especially as a bricks and mortar business, I think, um, you know, to, to hit that from a standing start is phenomenal. Um, what would you say was kind of the, um, I guess, one of the biggest success factors in that? Um, to, well, just getting that support, really getting people coming back because we, we um, change the rooms um, periodically, just getting people coming back who are you know, wanting to come back to the new room. And then, to, and then organically growing and recommending um, people. And we have people from all over the country coming, um, coming to, to play. And in terms of um, forgetting about the crisis now, where does the business need to get to? So we'll focus on the one location for the time being. Yeah. Where does that business need to get to in order to kind of start to achieve the, the, the financial goals that you and the directors have laid out for business? I think um, that both rooms um, need to be running... Um, as much as they can so they need to be running seven days a week um and for the time period obviously people aren't going to be playing at two o'clock in the morning um but uh, physically um but you know running as much as they can be seven days a week and then in the other locations as well building them up um to be as um each of the other locations has got one room and they need to be running um, seven days a week as, as much as they can. And that has a knock on effect then because we'll be able to be employing more people um, and really seeing that um, benefit to the local community because that's what we're about as well, is going into um, locations that aren't premium town centre um, and doing up a unit that's not loved um, and breathing life back into a community because people will travel to come to an escape room yeah and, that, and that's what we found yeah so in terms of your role in the business so you obviously deal with the num number side of it yeah. the accounting yeah. side of things so if it's okay, yeah. if it's not um too up front of me to ask mm -hmm. imagine if both the rooms in the current location were full and let's say for example argument's sake it was pushing out somewhere close to 20k turnover what sort of um net profit would you expect that to sort of produce on the bottom line it yeah, it's really, really good uh, net profit. It's it's about half, um, half the right. yeah, yeah. So the the more um, the more rooms that we can run in a location, then um, then you know it's split between variable and fixed. We've got the the rent, um, and then we've got the variable cost, the the games master, um, controlling and facilitating facilitating the game. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to flip over just to my share screen for a second, just so um, we can start to kind of build up a picture of things mm -hmm. as I'm making my notes. So I did make lots of notes earlier on, as you can see on the other page, yeah, but I'm yeah. not going to share those. That's, that's just for me to see. Yeah. Um, so one of the challenges with physical bricks and mortar spaces tends to be that um, uh, once, you're, once you hit capacity, mm -hmm. now most people make a really big mistake at this point. They assume that the capacity um, is actually 100% of the time the slots being filled yeah um, but actually uh that's complete bunkum the optimal capacity and this came out of um things like the toyota manufacturing plants and kind of just in time thinking and all yeah. that sort of production line side of things the optimal um amount of capacity that you should be aiming for is actually 72 okay. percent and the reason the science if you're interested behind it and this is a very quick potted history of, yeah. of how somebody much cleverer than me came to that that number for every one percent you go over 50 percent of your capacity um it's actually worth two percent 
Now, the reason why it's not 75% is because obviously if we, if you were to like, you know, so what we're saying here is that actually at 72% capacity, you know, as you see it physically, you are actually already operating at 94% of capacity. So the extra 22% times by two, 94%, and that gives you 6% wiggle room. And the reason for that is obviously because imagine you've got a machine uh, stamping metal products in a, in a manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. And as you send the, the pieces into it, uh, that machine over a period of time is going to degrade, become less efficient. You're going to have problems. There's going to be um, bits and pieces that come out of it that aren't perfect sort of wastage and things yeah. like that. Now, I know that's obviously production line methodologies and thinking, but actually I've applied this to many service-based businesses. And if you try and make a service-based business run at hundred percent capacity, it breaks basically. So that's my, that's my non uh, scientific um, explanation for it. Okay. So 72% is actually critical. Great. That you're pushing that, that profit. So it's just some, that's more something to be wary of. Um, also, another thing is at the moment you've got, you've got kind of, um, and we're going to start to build up a picture in a second. So you've kind of got um, effectively one core product sat at the center of your business. Mm. Um, now I have something called a product architecture model, which in, in, involves um, several different sort of components. We have something called a breakthrough session. I'll come back to, I'll explain each of these in a second. Mm -hmm. You have something called a, this is less appropriate for you. This is more so for service-based businesses, but um, you have a, a sort of a, a qualification process to work out whether um, prospect, prospective clients are a good fit or not. You mm -hmm. have your marketing assets that you've built up. So your marketing assets um, feed people into your kind of qualification process, your dating process with your business, if you like. Yeah. That then feeds people into either a breakthrough product or straight down through into your core products. Um, I've, I've missed off a step there, but it's fine. It doesn't matter for this, this case. And then you've got one core product. So it's okay. kind of like if the rug gets pulled under your feet yeah. like now and you can't yeah. deliver that core product, whew, okay, we've got nothing there to... So what's got to happen immediately is you've got to um, come up with a, a new idea. It's potentially going to be um, sold into a new market. Uh, that takes time, energy, and effort. Yeah. Um, it takes time, energy, and effort to then market and sell it. And then next thing you know, crisis disappears. We go back to how we were and we've expended all this energy and actually we're back to the same place. Mm -hmm. So where I would like to get you to, hopefully, and it might we might not answer all of the questions now, by the way, but it'd be great if either we had more core products and I normally recommend having three to five, which I'll be honest, is simple for you because we add in, you know, um, location number one and location number, you know, three to your current location number two. And now you've got multiple core products. If you like, if you, if you, if you want to call it that, um, it, this this is a dumb example I'm about to give you for example um, but for argument's sake you know if you were to look at um, let's take center parks mm. now imagine center parks may have a an escape room but they may also have cycle paths paintballing swimming and all these different kind of complementary you know um, entertainment type activities yeah. so really you want your core products to be like complementary but not the same if that makes sense yeah that's that's really interesting because each of our locations are, are dependent on us being able to deliver them and yeah. at the moment we can't deliver so none of none of it works that's it so we're going to fix that that's the plan that's why it's called fix your business so we're going to come up now i know that obviously with the crisis in mind you've you've created a couple of different products so there's an at-home kit which you're in the process of um, rolling out which yeah. I think it's ten pounds, isn't it? And then yeah, you've got the the online version, which you can still take groups of six. You're going to have one person in in the room, and then they yeah. guide them around, which is yeah. a really great adaptation of a of a product. Mm. But I wanted to what the reason why um, we're obviously talking at length beforehand. So, um, would it be fair to say that um, I mean this is this is great because you end up with you know what let's say three hundred visits uh, times by you know, whatever the price is, which I think yeah. you said 60 to 70 yeah. pounds. Okay. So that gives you your sort of roughly 18, 20 K turnover. That's how I came to that sort of conclusion, yeah. but you're relying on people to, you're kind of having to like 
sell, deliver, sell, deliver, sell, deliver, sell, deliver, sell, deliver, sell, deliver. Something goes wrong. Somebody gets ill. We can't sell. We can't deliver. Now we've got no revenue. Now things are fixed, right? Sell, deliver, sell, deliver. I think it would also be quite nice if you can um, come up with what I call a follow-on product. Yeah. Um, yeah. And these happen in, there's three different types of follow-on product, which I'll explain. Mm-hmm. Now the follow-on products, you can potentially kind of take people straight through, you know, ignoring the core products and straight down to the follow-on products. Mm-hmm. In effect, it becomes like a, a complementary product. Does that make sense? Yeah, because we were we do change the rooms, so we don't. Um, some escape rooms just have however many rooms they've got, and they don't change the theme. So we were changing the theme, um, but we wondered whether. Um, if we did a different model that we would have to change the rooms quite so often. Potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. What you, yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things that I'm, so with the following products and this is where you, you kind of, you're on the right track with how you've pivoted. So, or how you've adapted your, your products so far, but you have, um, they kind of break down into three different models. So you have your DIY follow-on products. So do it yourself, your home yeah. kit. Yeah. You have your, what we call done with you. DWI, um, which is kind of um, y- your business is kind of a DWI because you need somebody to, to facilitate the yeah. session yeah. with people. There is also a, a third one which is less appropriate to you, um, which is uh, done for you. As like people come for the experience, you can't really do that. Like give them that experience um, passively. Um, no, no, because part of it is. Um, finding the clues, bringing them together, bringing a bit from over there, a bit from over there, and bringing it together to make the answer. Yeah. However, imagine, imagine actually that there's probably a group of people out there who maybe don't always want to be participating. Yeah. They don't mind watching. Yes. Now, a friend of mine said, uh, I'll watch, you know, my friends in the room, but I'm not being in that room. Yeah. Yeah. So there's your done for you. So they, they can passively just watch it, but you can still yeah. potentially get generate some income from it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I'm thinking is that, um, or, or what we discussed beforehand. So your, your DIY is kind of your home kit. You've got that, that yeah. going, which is great. Yeah. So you created this. And, and this is one of the great things about when a crisis happens, when you've got to make difficult decisions for a business, yeah. um, it makes you think creatively about different products you can introduce into your business. So, you know, this, the home kit might not have happened had, the current situation not happened. So, um, but I'm, I'm kind of most interested in what this done with you type product could look like for you. So, um, and I hope you don't mind me bring, bringing this up now, but obviously one of the challenges which we faced whilst we we're doing the pre interview was your, uh, it's what I call, it's just a situational bias. It's a bias towards your yeah. own product where you, yeah. and naturally so your product is great. I'm not suggesting it's not great, but, you because you're so focused on your own product the model which you've created and invest all this time energy and effort into you and the four directors yeah it's hard to see you sort of start to lose situational awareness of what's going on around that Mm -hmm. um so we did a bit of work beforehand to kind of like what what opportunities are there that sit outside this yeah and you had to um it it was a real struggle to get to me to think outside the box yeah to think that the product could work in any other way. Yeah. So what we came up with, so, and this is where probably for those, maybe give people a, a, a very quick introduction about like the escape room model and how that works. So our model is um, a team of six people would go into a room, the door is locked and they've got an hour to, um, to solve puzzles in the room. They don't know what the puzzles are because we don't have a one, two, three, four, five, however many. There'll be maybe um, a bit of a clue over there and a bit of a puzzle, and you've got to you've got to resource investigate the room um, and bring um, different things together to be able to see that it is a puzzle to be able to get the answer to go on to the next puzzle. Um, and that's our model at the moment. And we have two different rooms, and we change the theme of that room. Uh, regularly um and that's our model at the moment and it and it's it's a brilliant model incredibly popular model but obviously it's 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 difficult to roll out if something happens if you can't deliver it on-prem so on-premises so 
Um, what I was looking at was I, uh, when I when I try and create follow on products or complementary products, you got to um, almost extract the remove the physical limitations. Yeah. yeah. The room, the fact that you have to have six people and somebody directing it. Yeah. Um, and you've got to start asking slightly different questions, which is why do people go and use escape rooms? Um, yeah. So the obvious ones are the puzzle, the problem solving, puzzle solving. Yeah. There's the social aspect with friends. Yeah. Um, there's the escapism. You know, the fun yeah. Yeah. and finding, and, and this is where we kind of led on to the well, how you know, what, how could we take those aspects, the reasons why people go and do it and create a follow-on product from it that potentially could be subscriber based you know now more than ever businesses um are looking to create sustainable recurring revenue Mm -hmm. it it doesn't have to be all of the revenue so i'll give you an example of this so um one of my clients runs a medical aesthetics business okay they're doing botox injectables Mm -hmm. and things like that very typical high street you have to it's physical you have to be in there there isn't a di well there is a diy option hopefully nobody ever did injects themselves but Mm -hmm. um you know uh and uh this is this is a whole sort of done with you done for you model Mm -hmm. and what they were doing is the whole the whole revenue was based on people coming into the clinics and having injections and treatments and things like that we did introduce a whole load of non-invasive um products into their into the mix as well so we expanded their core products yeah yeah One of the most, uh, the best decisions that we made with their business, though, was to introduce some kind of a subscription model, right? Now, it sounds weird, Botox on subscription, right? Yeah, okay. Um, However, and it's it's not for everybody, I get that. But um, one of the things we did is we created this package, which was, um, and there are medical reasons why people need Botox, by the way. It's not just for cosmetic reasons. There's also medical reasons. So we created a package where they would have... um, uh, the injectables plus they would also have something called a hydrofacial which is a non-invasive treatment a mix of them over the course of 12 months to create a specific outcome and that would be paid on a monthly rolling basis so is that like um going to the dentist when you you might have a a checkup you go to see the hygienist and you get all that rolled in and and paid monthly essentially yeah it's 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 like that it's kind of just getting those monthly payment plans now mm-hmm. their their subscriptions probably only make up about 15% of their overall turnover it was obviously zero but in the last year we've got them up to about 15% and the goal is to ultimately get them to 25% because at 25% some interesting stuff started to happen for their business mm-hmm. um all the rent on the three clinics was paid for mm-hmm. a majority of the salaries were paid for and a majority of the operating expenses were paid for it was only the variable cost as you said so they have to pay a license fee every time they use do an injection or use a piece of machinery so it's only really those variable costs and if they had to ramp staff up or down depending on how busy they were mm-hmm. so at a time like now you know their business is still collecting those mm-hmm. monthlies because they've either delivered the treatment or they still are go- they're going to deliver the treatment in the future so the client's happy to pay them so it's created that sustainable revenue so w- this is why you have your core products here Um, which do bring in a big chunk of change and they will do. And when the crisis is over, we talked about, you know, well, imagine if we had double, treble, quadruple the audience to to relaunch in, you know, September, January, whenever we kind of are allowed back out Mm -hmm. again and back into normal Mm -hmm. life. But straight away, you jump from eight and a half K to 20 K because you've got double, treble, quadruple the size of the audience to launch your product Mm -hmm. into. So that'll take care of itself. But what about if actually we could create um, something down here that was, um, I don't know, imagine if it was producing um, somewhere between 20, uh, sorry, 10 and 15% mm. of your monthly revenue was recurring. Yeah, yeah. That would be nice. And what we're talking about here is, so this is where we're going to kind of summarize it and bring it back now, mm. is we take all of the elements of the, uh, of the why. So why do people use escape rooms? The, the where is obviously going to be, well, online. Let's create an online version of it somehow. So here we're talking about, you know, we talked about fun. Uh, we talked about problem solving. A competition uh, against somebody else. The, the competitive factor of it. Yeah. So let's write that down. So competition. Yeah. We had to remove, so the, what we could do without, basically. So we had to remove the physical element. Yeah. Because that was, that was, you kept on coming back to that. We can't do it because we can't do it because we had to remove the physical element of it. Yeah. 
and actually what what i suggested and this is whether it you know this is something to put to the directors and test and trial and things like that well actually what if you just had a um let's say one to two weekly games so delivered via zoom uh any number of people could join zoom you can have hundreds of people on there it'd be a bit crazy but you get community managers to help you manage that some of your existing staff potentially yeah yeah so any number of people And what you do, you, you treat it, it's almost like um, you gamify it. So it's like like a pub quiz, but with problem solving. Yeah? Now, I've, I've been to free pub quizzes. I've been to paid pub quizzes. I'm quite happy to chuck a fiver in the pot if there's a chance. If we win, we might get the whole pot and give some money to charity and things like that. So what I was thinking is, could you have a, a package which is I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 20 pounds a month. And you've got to test the pricing to see what people are comfortable with. And all you need, I say all you need, but all you need is a hundred subscribers. Mm. Oops. I can't even write at the moment. <laughs> so a hundred subscribers and there you go. You're at, you know, I mean, that's a hundred would be one K a month. Let's say we get, you know, either 200 subscribers or put it up to 20 pounds. You know, we're going to kind of, you're starting to get somewhere close to your, 10 to 15 percent of regular incoming money yeah. and the nice thing about this is this post dates the crisis you can keep on doing this um you've told me that you've got a your brand is starting to be recognized further afield and people will travel yeah well this is this will appeal to them too yeah and this is a global thing isn't it yep. and this is um a one night a week um and they can they can pay the 10 pound a month mm. they can come to as many events as you're putting on you know it's you kind of make it un, unlimited almost uh i mean if you're only doing one or two a week there's kind of limitations on that anyway it might be to start i mean this is where you get into the real nitty-gritty of kind of the business model if you've got different time zones people coming in from all over the world you're going to have to start having games starting at different times and things like that yeah the the lim one of the limiting factor then is the amount of games the amount of puzzles that we can come up with um to be able to keep keep it new keep it fresh yeah so i mean i, I don't know i what one of the things which i looked at was and i mean this that that's one of the things which you and your expert team of puzzle creators yeah. will have to you yeah. know come up with an answer to but let's say it's it's an hour uh um you know and maybe i don't know how long like the puzzle's like five or ten minutes or something like that but let's let's say for example like ten minutes yeah on average when you by the time you've done the the front matter the introduction and the outroduction that's five puzzles per week mm -hmm. you know so maybe actually let's let's scrub the two and we'll just do one a week yeah. it's five puzzles a week that you've got to come up with mm -hmm. in a year's time you'll get some attrition anyway but in a year's time you can start to re either recycle some of those puzzles or come up with new versions of the same puzzles yeah um, you know, that's where your IP is going to be. What you could also do is give people a, a library, a ba you could create a bank of puzzles and mm -hmm. people could just pay 10 quid a month. Well, let's say for example, ah, now this could be interesting. Uh, can't do it on this page. Let's go on to a new page. Mm -hmm. We could have, we could have the, um, I'm doing red, let's stick with the red. So you could have the live version mm -hmm. and then you could also have the, uh, the library version. Yeah. So for, uh, let's say, for example, so obviously, as it sounds, you can take part in as many live games as you want, or you can just dip into the library whenever you want. Each of these are £10 a month each. Mm. Uh, or if you want them both, uh, it's £20 a month. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. So now you've got two following products, three following products. <laughs> so we've got live or library or both. Mm -hmm. What a great range of choice. It is, it is. Um, it is. And, and that, like I said, can be sold in addition to your core products. Yeah. I mean, even if um, at the, we were changing the, the room every two months and then kind of went oh, well, let's put more money into, um, into props so that um, we, 
they were better quality pop props would last longer um, and we would go to every four months every six months but if we're not putting the money into the props and it's very much um, that you know that this is really tweaking the puzzle isn't it that it's all digital um, and you're not building physical um, physical props um, there's no overheads or yeah, very little overhead yeah, yeah it's a very that. different sort of puzzle isn't it um, the other thing as well is this would create an amazing community of people who eventually yeah. as a little bonus yeah. um, you could start to throw in um, and I mentioned two things that you could do you could have an annual conference yeah you know get people in a room for a day solving problems yeah which is paid for and that could be people will pay any they'll pay hundreds for events if they're good yeah. Yeah. You know, um, or you could potentially do um, competitions. Yeah. Um, who did I saw? So uh, one of my existing clients is a break dancer, okay. and obviously break break dancing. You have these things called battles where you dance have dance off against somebody else, yeah. or somebody is organising a one versus a one on one break dancing competition, like knockout competition. Yeah. Um, throughout the UK and so you upload your video of your battle they place they put your dance they put you up against another person the yeah. judges decide which was their favorite and then you go through to the next round yeah. and they're just doing this until you know they end up with a winner yeah that's but what about as well getting um because these are enthusiasts who play this and part of our team is made up of volunteers of escape room enthusiasts yeah. who who come up with these puzzles. What about pitching our, um, um, the, the contestants, if you like, against each other? Can you come up with a puzzle that nobody else can solve? Great idea, there you go. So you didn't even need my help to come up with that. That's a great idea. So, you know, puzzle creation. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's, you're already starting to now do the work yourself, which means that I've, I've, successfully completed my part of the job what i what i will do um lizzie is i've i've got my notes here obviously this has been mm. recorded so i'll get the recording to you and if you want if you're happy to share it with your colleagues and see what yeah. they think yeah um i will also send you a um a screenshot of each of my three page yeah. notes as well um so that you've got a copy of those but how does that feel having gone through that no, process no, it's really good and i would love the product owner to um to go through this process as well for her because that's been an amazing journey for her um in in growing in growing this project yeah yeah and there's there's i mean we could go, i could go on for hours um mm. you know you notice i'm wearing a branded t-shirt for example yeah. you know there could be um you know labyrinth t-shirts and merchandise that you can sell just as another passive income yeah. You could have, you, um, you've got the online kit. There's just one kit at the moment, but you could have 20 kits that you could start to go into um, uh, the Amazon marketplace and start selling those. That could be um, particularly um, profitable for you, potentially. Yeah. Um, because, because, like you just said, your target market is so tight. Like people who do this are enthusiasts. Um, it's like, the, the, you know, they will invest in products if there's a good brand. Yeah. And, and it's entertaining. Um, I was saying when we were offline, you know, I, I used to have an office above um, a games workshop in the local town. Yeah. And it, I, I don't fully understand it. You know, I'm, I'm into my things and I didn't fully understand what was going on. But what I used to love seeing as a business owner was actually looking in through their window when I wrapped up my day at five o'clock and they were kind of just starting one of their workshops. Yeah. And these kids who are just absolutely enthralled, they're engaged, they're chatting to one another. Uh, they've got these most amazing models which they've created and painted and yeah, yeah. Um, and they've got these games all set out like strategy games um, and I was blown away by you know what they did down there and it used to like I used to get enjoyment out just like looking yeah. in and seeing what they were getting up to so I can mm -hmm. only imagine what it's like to, to participate so when you've got you know um, that level of enthusiasm this could be like opening Pandora's box for you if you well, want it right well, part of it for those gate for the games um, workshop is actually painting and building your models isn't it it's mindfulness so, like at, at its best so you, you get into flow bring, you bring your puzzles to to the workshop yeah 
which is which is amazing so i think there's a there's a ton of opportunity for yeah. you there yeah. um lizzie i i appreciate you know i've i've talked a lot as we've been going through that but obviously we did a lot of prep work beforehand hopefully people can start to see how we go about sort of um productizing a service like yours and how you start to build up those various different revenue streams from it so um yeah. thank you very much for being no, here you. on fix your business yeah, no, it's been a really good experience. Thank you. My pleasure. And if anybody else wants to take part in Fix Your Business and have me go through uh, the inner workings of how you've organised your products, how you price it, and what opportunities might be available for you, please do. Um, you can drop me uh, a comment either below the video um, with your details um, or email me, robin at, so that's R-O-B-I-N at fearless.biz. And you can be just like Lizzie and her amazing team of escape room artists, is that a thing? Uh, you know, and the great business which she's created there. And actually, despite the current circumstances, what a great business it has the potential to even grow into further. So thank you once again, Lizzie. Thank you.